We're going to be in, in Luke 23, some, <laughs> it's as good a springboard as, as any to look at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can have them open to Luke 23. If you don't, for the first time in like 9 billion months, I get to say it's in the handout that you received and it's on the back side of the, um, uh, of the sermon outline. You can follow along as, long, as well as with some other complimentary passages. If this is true, if, if this statement is even true, if in the history of the church, the Holy Spirit has been the, the more uh, neglected person in the Trinity, and if not neglected, certainly the most misunderstood person in the Trinity, then Jesus' burial has been the most neglected point in the gospel message. In its most concise form, the gospel message is kind of Trinitarian in itself, death, burial, resurrection. And we, we emphasize Jesus' death as we should. It's the cross, the shed blood that we, that we talked about last week that was a substitute for our sins, for the punishment that we deserve. So we should emphasize the death of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus, it's one of the two great days of the Christian calendar, right? Easter, where we gather and we celebrate what God has done by raising Jesus, giving us hope that there's more to life than just life, death, burial, but there is resurrection. But it's that middle <laughs> word in the gospel. I would, I would go so far as to say that this may be the first sermon you've ever heard dedicated solely to the burial of Jesus. It's certainly the first sermon I've preached dedicated solely to the burial of Jesus. There are no Jesus is buried worship services. There's no Jesus is buried worship songs. We came close, we said graves to gardens. I did grow up singing up from the grave he arose. Anyone sing that song? All right. But then we quickly got to the resurrection. There are no Jesus is buried holidays. In between Good Friday and Easter, we hunt eggs and we plan for a dinner, don't we? Yet there it is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses three and four. Again, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. It shouldn't surprise us. In fact, we should get clues about how important the middle message or point of the gospel is because all four gospel accounts talk about the burial of Jesus. Clearly, there are some lessons to be gained from this point in the gospel. So this morning... We're going to look at the burial of Jesus on, on, on two levels, if you will. First, we're going to learn from the people who were involved. As we read the narratives, and we're going to look at Luke in, in particular most extensively, but also John will look at a little bit of Mark and Matthew. This is the focus that they describe the events surrounding the crucifixion, and they focus for a moment in time on the burial, burial. That's what we're going to do this morning. So that's the first level, just kind of on the surface, if you will. Second, we're going to learn the truth that is taught. So no pun intended, we're going to look below the surface at the burial of Jesus because there are hints and there are clues and there are statements pointing to the necessity of Jesus three days in the tomb. The gospel holds out hope to those who believe, and the point of the gospel is no less, or this point of the gospel is no less a part of that hope than the death and the resurrection. So, first, let's look at the people who are involved, and to do that, we're going to turn to Luke 23 and his account, beginning in verse 50. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. 
This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen, a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Father, would you uh, open our hearts and our minds to see the full message this morning of the good news. As we looked last week at the purpose of Jesus' death and his suffering, shedding blood, substitution for us, and as we look ahead at the glory of resurrection, would this message of his burial not be lost on us? And would we learn from those surrounding the burial as well as the message that permeates all of Scripture about the necessity of his burial? So open our hearts and our minds to your insights, to your truth, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this first part, this first level, the narrative, the the people who are involved, we see first the determined courage of Joseph and Nicodemus. And all of a sudden you're going like, well, where did Nicodemus come from? So hang in there with me. We're going to borrow for some other, from some other accounts. Determined courage of Nicodemus. So to help with understanding where Nicodemus comes from, we do borrow from John's account, John chapter 19, beginning with verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. So who earlier had come to Jesus by night, reminding us that this is the same Nicodemus as John chapter 3. He came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as is the burial custom. So there's our introduction to Nicodemus, who's also a part of this. Now, I didn't make up the fact that I think this took a bit of courage for them because so again, if you're keeping score, the gospel writers, together they get this beautiful picture, 1943 says, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, just like Luke told us, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Mark's not making that up. He's not trying to build up Joseph. It took courage for him, and I think presumably for Nicodemus, to do what they did surrounding the burial of Jesus. Both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea are a part of what the narratives call the council, the council. When you see that, often in the New Testament, the council or or you'll see terms like the elders and the chief priests, that refers to the great Sanhedrin. That was their ruling body of government. That was like our Supreme Court. So Joseph and Nicodemus are both members of the Sanhedrin. The same Sanhedrin, the same ruling body that paid Judas 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. They're members of the same court that brazenly sought false testimony against Jesus so they could have a reason to ask Pilate for the death sentence. This is the same body of of, of leaders that spit in Jesus' face and struck him. This is the same Sanhedrin that persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas in exchange for Jesus. And it's the same Sanhedrin after the resurrection that bribed Roman soldiers to tell the people that Jesus' disciples had stolen the body. And against that body, at least two, Nicodemus and Joseph, 
courageously stand against them. John tells us as much, or Luke told us as much. Joseph did not consent with all that the rest of his fellow Sanhedrin members were consenting to. What's it like to veto? <laughs> What's it like to say no when everyone else around you is saying yes? Why would they do that? Not only would they, did they not go along with what's being done, but then when Jesus is dead, they have to face their fellow Sanhedrin members in carefully, graciously taking care of the body, as well as going before Pilate one more time. And you've got to think by this time, Pilate has about had it with members of the Sanhedrin. It took courage for them to go and do what they did. Why would they do it? Is it, is it just simple respect for the dead? Or is there more? I, I admit, I'm, I'm, I'm conjecturing, there's a bit of conjecture here. I, I'm not suggesting they had greater faith than anyone else or deeper understanding of the gospel than anyone else. But then again, they might have. Luke says Joseph was looking, Mark as well, that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. John calls him a disciple, secretly, but now the secret's out. Why does he do that? I mean, there's no, there's no guesswork now. The longer I've been a Christian, and I, I use that phrase a lot now. I'm just now, as soon as I said it, I thought, you're sounding old, and I say that a lot. The longer I've been a Christian, the more I have seen that it's the energy of quiet, um, kind of out of the way Christians that fuels the church. Joseph and Nicodemus are a part of the Jewish in crowd, but they're not a part of Jesus in crowd. They're not in his inner circle of friends. They're not one of the apostles. But it's, it's, it's their faith. It seems to me it's their courage. It's their determination that has this huge effect even later on the church, and we're still reading about it. God saw to it that we have this account still today, 2,000 years later. It seems to me that it's quite often that the energy of the church is fueled by the strength and convictions of the quiet, but the faithful. The energy of the church is fueled by a Roman soldier who tells Jesus, you don't have to come to my house to heal my son, you just say the word. And Jesus says, I haven't found faith like that in all of Israel. It, it's the energy supplied by a, a widow who gives the last coins in her possession for Jesus to say, she's given the most. There's your example. And, and those have energized the church for centuries and will till Jesus comes back. And let me offer another application and just ask this question of you. Is there a group in your life, a community that you're a part of, large or small, with which you need to take a stand and break apart? And I don't mean by that pointing fingers, accusing, condemning, judging. I just mean, is there, a, is there a community in your culture where you need to go against the flow? 
demonstrate your commitment to Jesus. Speaking of old songs like Up From The Grave He Rose, I grew up singing Stand Up, Stand Up For Jesus. Sentiment has kind of been lost. That that is exactly what we're called to do. You won't find any better examples than Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who just stand up, go against their community in courage and in boldness. That's, there's enough lessons right there to end, but we're not going to. A couple more observations. There's the evident devotion of the women. And it's, a just, it's a brief but a beautiful picture. Eventually, we come to know that the women are Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of a guy named Joseph. In chapter 24, uh, after the resurrection, Joanna, a gal named Joanna is mentioned. And it's just these women who, according to the verse right before we read in Luke 23, had been following the events from the very beginning all the way to the crucifixion. No doubt sickened by what they've seen, but too devoted to Jesus to leave. Hurt, beyond hurt, but too devoted to walk away. And they mourn and they grieve in their own way and one of the but they, it's like, it's like we have to do something. I shared with first service, I find things in my own study, in my own office during the week that I find funny, and then I try to convey that to you, and, and you all look like, at me like, that's not funny at all. But I found it, I just found it funny. Nicodemus brought how many pounds worth of ointment and aloe? 75 pounds. Patrick, do you want to carry 75 pounds of anything? 75 pounds, they're bringing this stuff. And then at the end of 20, Luke 23, our passage that we read, the women follow the body, they see where it's laid, and then they return with prepared spices and ointments. It's like they're saying, thanks guys, but this is how you do it. <laughs> I know you brought your 75 pounds, God bless you. You're stronger than us, but this is how you prepare a body. And I just found that funny. Why would they do that? There were 75 pounds. But if you want to do it right, a woman has to do it right. So and that's another sermon for another day. But I found that funny. But they're devoted. They're, it's their devotion. I, they, had to do, they had to. And it stands out, especially in light of, thirdly, the striking absence of the apostles. Joseph's there, Nicodemus is there, the women are there. You won't find a gospel account of the burial of Jesus that mentions anything about the apostles. We know they're together, but they're together at a distance. And again, I don't want to go too far to where scripture is silent. Maybe the disappointment was just too much. Maybe their fears were too great. Maybe their hopes were dashed. Like I said, everyone mourns and grieves differently, so I don't judge them, but I am, per I am perplexed by them. Their absence is striking. But it also serves to intensify some lessons that I think Jesus is teaching, God is teaching us in Jesus' burial. So let's look very briefly at just the truth that is taught. That's the surface level. Those are the people involved. Courage, devotion, as well as absence. Now let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. Again, no pun intended. What's, what's the burial of Jesus teaching us? First, we've said it many times already in this brief series. It's the fulfillment of Scripture. The fact that Jesus is buried is no less a fulfillment of Scriptures than, he, than his death and his resurrection. And a passage we'll probably look at next week David writes in Psalm 1610, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Scholars have pointed to the fact that that 
is an indication of Jesus' resurrection because his body's not going to decay in the tomb. But it, it's, there, there's the assumption, it's in the tomb. <laughs> David is saying your body will be in the grave, in the tomb. And then again, as Zach mentioned already this morning, Isaiah 53, we've gone to it several times. Isaiah 53, 9. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Well, what does it mean that he was a grave with the wicked? Well, he was falsely, he was accused of a criminal, falsely so. So the assumption, well, he must have been wicked. No, he was not, just falsely accused. And and with the rich man in his death, probably the, the tomb belonged to Joseph and he was a man of means. This was all done to fulfill scripture. No, again, no less so than the death and the resurrection. That's to say that the gospel was God's foreordained plan for the redemption of his, of his people since before time began. This is not plan B. This is not a panic move on God's part. And I know it begs a question, well, then why all this other stuff? Especially why the law? Why the Ten Commandments? And it's a good question. It's a question that Paul himself asks. Galatians 3.19, why then the law? He just brings it out. I mean, everyone's, as he writes the book of Galatians, he goes, everyone's asking it. I might as well just bring it out. Why then the law? Well, he gives a very clear and concise answer right afterwards. It's added because of transgressions. So let's just chase a rabbit trail just for a moment. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the law was given to reveal people's sinfulness and need for a savior. To reveal what was already in their hearts before the law. Because when a law says do this or don't do that, the sinful, depraved nature of man is to do the opposite. And again, every parent knows this because we see it in our children. When we tell them to do something, they do the opposite. When we say not to do something, they do it. So the law reveals this about us. Without it, we would deny that we have that kind of nature or we just wouldn't see it. But God knows us and because he knows us, he planned for his son to die for us to be buried, and to be raised. Jesus' burial is part of God's plan, and we see that because it fulfills Scripture. Secondly, below the surface, what's happening is we see this principle of life from death. Now, we're going to see this again next week, obviously, with the resurrection, but no less because <laughs> no resurrection without burial. No matter how many times I read about the virtue of patient endurance or preach sermons about lessons that we should learn while we wait, I personally still struggle when trials last longer than I'd like, when tribulations don't quickly disappear, when inconveniences drag on and problems are unresolved. I want quick and immediate resolution when things aren't the way I think they should be. And no matter how unfair I think it is, the truth is that God, more often than not, uses not just a trial, but the life of a trial to test us in order to grow us into spiritual maturity. The very thing we use to question God's love, the length of a trial, is the very thing God is using to reveal his love and show us his power. So for the 11 remaining apostles, because Judas has already killed himself, and the rest of Jesus' loyal followers, God ordained for them to wrestle with their hearts for three days while their friend lay in a tomb. It could have been three hours. It wasn't God's will. It could have been three months. <laughs> God was gracious, three days. Now, there were clues for them to think about. Clues about how this period of waiting was to build in them an anticipation of life. They missed the clues. We have the benefit of reviewing them in scripture. 
think you have these scriptures in the back of your outline as well. Matthew 12, beginning with verse 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be there, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. There's your sign. After three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, which Jesus says is symbolic of burial, new life emerged among the inhabitants of the wicked city of Nineveh because repentance came after hearing God's message. Life came from death. Second clue, John chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. The Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? And then John gives us the commentary. He was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. Burial, this lesson is lost. This piece of, 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 of faith isn't developed. Finally, John chapter 12. Now this is a passage that's often quoted in another context, but I think has everything to do with Jesus' burial. Chapter 12, verse 20, among those who went to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, these Greek believers came to Philip, who was, with, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What was buried in the earth had to be buried in order to bear much fruit. Life comes from death. Again, I, it's impossible to know for sure. But doesn't it seem like if Jesus had come back to life the next morning, the reaction of the apostles would have been different? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> we thought you were really dead. Glad you're okay. What about that Judas? <laughs> he was a liar from the beginning. And they do it. It just, life would have just gone back to normal. Normal routines, normal complaints, normal issues. But wait three days. Again, that Jesus is in that tomb, behind that stone. The one you confessed to be Christ is in there. Is he still the Christ? Is there any hope of eternal life now that Jesus is in that tomb? It doesn't matter if your waiting is three days, three months, or three years. Jesus' burial shows that life on the other side of, that there is life on the other side of death. And that's what matters. Everything until then is a part of the third lesson in truth to be gained that our faith is to be tested. It's the testing of our faith. Will we trust and believe? Will we walk in fear or faith? Because really it comes down to this. And you can just, again, you can almost imagine, you don't understand. Our friends took him from the cross. He was wrapped in cloth. He was anointed. He was placed in a tomb. The stone was rolled in front 
All that means is that Jesus' burial was a really hard test. We talk a lot about waiting in sermons because the Bible talks a lot about waiting. There are examples, there are parables, proverbs, statements. It still remains one of the greatest tests of our faith. Why is that? I don't have all those answers. I ask it of myself. But there's one little practical clue as to why waiting sometimes is so hard for us. When you fly into the Kansas City airport, you just, you go out the gate, you look a little bit to the right or the left, you find out where your luggage carousel is, and you're there in what, 30 seconds? And then what do you do? You wait. You wait for an eternity, and it's really close to an eternity. I'm not exaggerating. And I remember doing that as a, you know, on a few occasions as a child. Then I, then we, I moved to L.A., and, you, and when you fly into L.A. and you leave the gate area, and there's other airports that do this, you start walking. You follow, you're following the signs. You turn right, you left, your, your, your stairs, your escalators, your movers, and, and you... It takes you about five or six minutes, but you get to the luggage carousel and there's luggage starting to come down. And you think, this is fantastic. What's wrong with my, what's wrong with Kansas City? The time's the same. It's about six to eight minutes, the same time. The difference is in Kansas City, it's unoccupied time. You stand there with your arms folded, patting your foot. The other, it's occupied time. I say that because the next time the apostles have to wait for the Holy Spirit, it's occupied time. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, all of these, the apostles, the disciples, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now again, I, I don't know if they weren't praying the three days of Jesus' tomb, time in the tomb. I don't know that. I can't say that. But I do know that what the next time they had to wait, Luke is clear. They occupied their time in prayer. Waiting time is not wasted time unless we waste it. Jesus' burial in Joseph's tomb forever teaches us that God has a purpose in our times of waiting. He had a purpose for Mary and Martha as they waited for Jesus to arrive when their brother Lazarus was sick and eventually died. He had a purpose for the apostles who waited three days while Jesus lay in the tomb. And he had a purpose in waiting in the life of a pastor in Munich, Germany, whose testimony I'd like to share. His name is Matthias Lohmann who wrote, I didn't need God. That at least is what I thought growing up. I was not against Christianity. Having grown up in the Lutheran State Church in Germany, I even considered myself to be a Christian, but I had never heard the gospel. When I was 25 years old, I met a girl. I liked her, asked her out, but she turned me down. She told me that as a believer, she wouldn't date a non-Christian and that she certainly had quite different ideas of dating than I did couldn't believe it. I, I was convinced she had overly protective parents. <laughs> Eventually, she agreed to meet me at her parents' house in order to tell me why she questioned my claim to be a Christian. I arrived being absolutely convinced that I would be able to talk her out of this. She told me the gospel. I left confused, realizing that she really knew what she was talking about and that I had no clue about these matters. It became clear to me that I was not a Christian and I began to wonder whether I should be. Months went by. I waited, continued to live my happy little worldly life, but God was drawing me. Nearly a year later, I went to a church service with this same young woman. 
And a few days later, in January 1998, I woke up one morning shaken and changed. God had revealed himself to me. I knew he existed, and I knew I had to turn to him for the forgiveness of my sins and a new life. By God's sovereign grace, I was converted. A few years later, I started taking seminary classes while I remained in my business career. And in 2008, 10 years after that initial meeting with his wife, soon-to-be wife, I finally left my business job and became the pastor of a church in downtown Munich. Every day, I see people all around me who think they don't need God. Today, it's my life's ambition to preach the gospel to these people. In the life of people who think they don't need God, don't underestimate the power of the gospel. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for the lessons that you are teaching us in the gospel. That we needed a substitute in our place to be a perfect sacrifice and you provide that in Jesus. And that it was necessary for him to be in the earth and for his followers to think about it and wonder about it and and even question it. But to be firmly convicted and convinced when their waiting was over. Help us, God, with these same lessons. Teach us your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.